All right. Welcome to another Rilvov Q&A session. We're just now getting started, and uh, I'm going to wait just a few seconds here as people come on board. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for attending. Thank you for taking the time to learn. Uh, this particular session that we go through, this is a, a, a kind of a weird one. It's not just a webinar. It's really a Q&A. It's, it's interactive with you guys. So one of the things that I want you guys to uh, take a look at in your on the right-hand side of your screen, typically anyway, is your GoToWebinar control panel. And in that control panel, you should see some information and stuff. There's a section there for questions so that you can type in your questions. You can um, type in whatever you want, and then we'll respond to those. This particular session of Q&A allows you guys to really – Ask me whatever you want. Ask me what uh, what challenges you're running into. Um, we don't really go through individual problems. If you're having any kind of problem, I really suggest that you uh, get onto our support chat line so that you can take uh, a one-on-one -on -one session with with Gary or or myself if you, if it comes to that. But we can go through answer uh, particular questions you may have that are you know, problems that you might be running into. If it's a general question or general problem, it's really what we, we want to help you through. There's going to be a, um, a list of things that typically people have whenever they first come into starting Realvolve, and we want to make sure that we answer those questions. So if you guys don't mind, um, in the questions area, uh, just answer, you know, type in yes or whatever if you can, if everything you can hear me and you can see my screen. I want to make sure that everything is a go there. Okay, we've got a few people there. All right. I um, want to thank everybody for uh, attending one last time. Just give you another, another second or two and we'll get going. Um, in the questions area, if you want to uh, type in any kind of questions you may have, you can do that. Also, over on the attendees area of your screen, you should be also be able to raise your hand. You can click on the little hand option um, to raise your hand, and I can just turn the mic over to you. Uh, turn your if your if your uh, microphone is live, you'll be able to ask your question. We can just kind of go through some question and answer, and certainly be able to do that. I typically like these to be smaller uh, sessions, just so that we can have that personal touch, and everybody can can ask their questions as they go along. So I do have uh, a few questions on here. looks like we're getting started. So if you've got a question, type it in or raise your hand, either one, and we'll go through those. Otherwise, I'll just go ahead and start um, going through these one by one. And I appreciate everybody coming. So the first question I'm seeing is, how do, how do I remove a user? Um, whenever, you, whenever you first get started, and uh, if you're a single account, you really don't have to, to worry about this. But if you've got multiple users, you've got multiple people, you want to add them or subtract from them, you're going to click on the little down arrow off of your top bar menu and go to settings. In the settings area, there is this users and permissions, users and permissions. Within the users and permissions section, um, you can have, depending on your account type, you can have multiple um users that you can can add you can invite them using the invite a user whenever you invite a user you type in their name first name and last name and then their email address and then click on the send invite and send invitation that then sends them an invitation they can then get that invitation click on the link so that they can then put in their password and then have a live um, link to it so at any point, maybe you've got um, somebody in here and they've been added. Once they've been added, they're added as a standard user. So this uh, the, the make as admin is not typically checked. And with that, they will only see their own records if, if they don't have any kind of uh, admin rights or if you don't have any kind of security permissions above what the, the normal is. Uh, but if at any point you get that person and maybe they, they're they going to leave uh, your employment or whatever, or they're, they're not going to be in your team anymore, you can come over here on the right-hand side 
and click on the delete option to delete this user. Now let me, uh, I'm going to go to a different one here. Let me just go to this MAS one. It's a sample one. So it's going to come up and ask you some questions because it wants to make sure that the, the delete process works the way you need it to. The first thing is, is um, do you really want to delete this sub user? You can cancel out if you want to. But along with deleting them, if you do want to proceed, how do you want to deal with the data that's in the database? Uh, do you want to transfer that data to another user? In which case, um, any, th any records, any calendar, any um, things that belong to this user can be transferred to another user. You can choose transfer or you can choose delete. If you just want to wipe them out and wipe out anything that they put in, you can certainly do that. You, know, you would choose the delete and then click on the proceed. At that point, it will do whichever uh, you've chosen, whether it be transfer. On the transfer option, it does ask which person do you want to transfer to. So um, select one of your existing users. Maybe you want to bring that contacts, all that contact information to your record. You can certainly do that. So that's how that's done. Um, I want to click on cancel because I really don't want to delete this person. Um, but that's that's how it's done. Just clicking on the little delete option in the upper right hand corner. Hope that made sense. Um, OK, um, <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, just this past week and bear with me just a little bit. Let me get uh, to this because I was just testing this, in fact. Um, playing around with it. The question is, is um, how does the new email tracking work? Well, one of the things that happened last week was our team implemented the first round, <clears throat> excuse me, the first round of our email tracking UI, user interface, for, well, ever since I've been with Realvolve uh, for the past three years, we've actually been sending emails um, through the system and we track how that information um, is is going through the system whenever you send an email uh, it gets processed it gets uh, delivered to the the person the person can then open it and whenever they open it they might click on something they might choose to mark it as spam it may have bounced it may have been blocked I mean, there's lots of different things that can happen and we've always tracked that information within Realvolve, but we've never, until this past week, actually exposed that to you guys to let you guys actually see what's happening. So um, what, uh, what you can do now, and just kind of take it from start to finish here, is I'm going to click on the little uh, envelope to send a new message. And I'm going to send this message to myself. I want to say, uh, new test, if I can spell right. Test of email tracking. So I just did this just literally a few minutes ago. It's kind of weird. Um, so here is a message, and I'm just going to say, um, hello world. How is the tracking going? Okay, so got a little message. I got, um, there's two people that I'm going to be sending this to. I'm going to send it to, to mark.step at gmail.com and also my mark at realvolve.com. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and click on send email. So what happens is, is whenever that email gets sent, it goes through our servers and starts the process of dealing with it. Now, for the first few seconds, you won't see any kind of status or anything. After that, you'll start seeing these other options that are in there. Uh, once it actually gets through our servers and starts the processing of it, then it gives you this status of processed. Now, what that means basically is the fact that we know that you sent the message. It hit our, our outbound servers to be sent, um, and that's as far as it's gone. It's, it's, it's being sent right now, um, but we don't have any further status. Now, I'm going to go ahead and click on the radar one more time, and it still says processed. Let me uh, refresh it one more time here. Should at some point, once it gets processed, it should eventually say delivered. 
sometimes it takes a little bit for it to update. What happens is um, it hits our SMTP server, and then once it goes to the the uh, the receiving POP server or IMAP server, then that information is relayed back to our server. Okay, there it goes. So now it knows that at least it has been delivered to the other server. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's been opened yet. It just means that it's been delivered to their, their box, their uh, mailbox. Now, there's some options that could be there instead of delivered. You could see uh, blocked. Um, it could see um, deferred. Um, and there's a couple other ones. I forget what they are now. Um, it also could say that uh, that it's been marked as spam. I mean, there could be a couple different options. And based off of different conditions, um, you might want to know what's going on. So I can come down here. If I open up this, this email, which is the email I just sent, down at the bottom, you'll see that there are different statuses that are showing. You'll see that it was processed. You can see what time it was processed and which email addresses it was processed for. In this case, we processed both email addresses, um, and they were delivered. They were processed at 12:09. If I go over here to the delivered, you'll see that they were delivered at 12:10. Uh, so both of them got processed. Both of them got delivered because I was sending it to two different email addresses. Now, on my other screen, I'm going to go over here to my email, and I'm going to click off of, uh, click on my email address to do a view of this this email so what I can do now is which you're not seeing it on my other screen but I can come back up here you'll see that it currently says it's delivered I'm gonna now click on radar just to refresh it and it should say that it's been opened there you go so it's been opened by me so now I know that it's been opened um, we look at our statuses and now there's a, another um, action that's been happened to it. it. It shows each of the different actions and where they're at. So not only was it delivered to both of those, it's been opened by one of them. So if I click on the one, I can see that I opened it in my mark.step at gmail account. So at 12.12. So um, all your different statuses from uh, marked as spam as process. There's I think there's nine different statuses of things that could happen at any time You're going to be able to access them and see what's happened if they bounced You can uh, there'll be a bounced option there and you'll be able to see why it bounced There'll be typically there'll be some kind of link some kind of information That's detailed in this area that allows you to see why it bounced or other information if um, in that same email, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and click on a link that's in that email that I sent, which was really just a link to my um, address here, this uh, realvob.com address. I'm going to come back up here, and I'm going to click on Radar again. Um, now it should have, instead of just open in the thing, it should say click. So now we know that... Not only has that email been open, but that person also clicked through um, on one of the links. So if I come down here and I can see the status, and sure enough, there's the click, and they it was clicked on the uh, gmail.com account. So that's really what this does. Now, there's going to be, and it's not there yet, but there's going to be more to this. And this is, this is where we're headed, and I want to make sure that you guys understand why we're doing this. Not only are we, are we exposing this to you, but uh, just imagine this. Now, this particular email was sent to two different email addresses, and, um, but it was only opened by one of them. Over time, and we're going to be analyzing this for you. It's not something that you're going to have to be doing any kind of analyzing of, but and really we're already analyzing it's just a matter of whether we when we show it to you um, we're going to open this up so that we can tell you when things are opened but not only when they're open but when is the trend of that person opening those emails do they open them up you know uh, periodically throughout the day or do they check their emails almost always at 10 o'clock in the morning 
Do they almost always check them on a particular email every morning? Um, this is going to give you some insight on when do I need to contact them. If I know that I'm only checking one email, which is which is an important thing to know, but I also know that 90% of the time they're being opened around 10 o'clock, that means this person typically they're in a, 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 a standard form of, uh, of, of a rut. They, they tend to open their emails at the same time every day. That gives you some good information on when should I be sending them email and which address should I be sending them to. So uh, if you're going to do any kind of uh, mail outs to them, what we're going to be doing, and it's, again, it's not there yet, we're going to have a preferred, uh, an, an option for you to deliver at a preferred uh, reading time. So whenever we see that 90% of the emails are being read at 10 o'clock, then, hey, we ought to be sending these emails around 10 o'clock. That way you're at the top of the list and you're getting um, that read as quickly as possible so that they can then be uh, dealing with it. And you're not at the bottom of the list. Maybe if you send something at 8 o'clock, they're checking their emails at 10. They may be starting at the top and going down and it takes you a while to actually be in that get response to or whatever and by uh, by allowing us to tell you when that information is being sent um, that will uh, that will help you guys out in the long run and be able to do things so uh, that's really where we're headed with that there's a lot more to it other than that the uh, the relationship score whenever you're sending and, and receiving emails if they're being delivered they're they're being opened, then the score goes up. If they're not being opened, they're not being clicked through, then the score can go down. So there's a lot more that's that's built into that. But uh, that's really the basics and the important part of for you guys to, to know how this new uh, email notification piece works. So hope that makes sense. Um, another question here, does Realvolve bypass follow-up boss? That's a great question. Um, there are... Uh, features in Follow Up Boss that we don't currently have in Realvolve. It's not to say that we're not going to have, just that we don't currently have. Uh, but there's a lot of things that Follow Up Boss just does not do. Follow Up Boss is really geared for lead generation. Um, we have a lot of Realvolve users that use Follow Up Boss in addition to Realvolve. And what they'll typically do is they'll take those leads and, and, uh, that, that come in from all your different sources and and process them in follow up boss like you normally would and then at some point whenever that that contact uh, turns into a client either a buyer or a seller then they'll take it and send it from follow up boss into Realvolve and then we take over the process from there because follow up boss's CRM just really is not a full blown CRM I mean it it, it it does some of the things, but there's there's a lot that it doesn't do, and that integration with your processes is is, is an important part. So, uh, a lot of people will use Follow Up Boss and then send the information in whenever it, it creates a contact um, to a a, uh, a buyer or seller. But um, other people will just say, "Well, I really like values of both of them," so they'll send as soon as the contact goes into Follow Up Boss. It'll let it do its thing, but also send that information into Realvolve and let us do our thing. Now, there are things in Follow Up Boss right now where, uh, and, and I don't know, I'll be the first to, to explain this, I don't know all the features of Follow Up Boss. So if anybody wants to correct me on any of this, certainly please do. Uh, from what I understand with Follow Up Boss, um, they do track some of the uh, the information like whenever people are visiting websites uh, doing things uh, how often are they visiting websites and and visiting the lead generation stuff bringing that information in and utilizing that for a lead score of some sort I think that's what they do um, that's important Intel and that's in uh, where we're headed we're not there yet but that's we, we are um, in some processes of doing some of that stuff, including some uh, new uh, uh, features through uh, another service we're going to be providing to allow you to uh, see information about your own homes as buyers or sellers, 
being able to track information on change and stuff like that. We're going to get more into, into that later down the road, but be able to show uh, show how, how that goes. But what that does is that deals with, again, the relationship score and making sure that that score uh, is is manipulated as people do things through different different uh, uh, websites, through emails. There's lots of things that this scoring uh, piece will, will actually go through. So um, got another question here. Hope that answered that, uh, Kathy. Uh, another question. Can you go over the escrow paperwork? How do you link with SureClose? Um, okay, I am not familiar with what SureClose is. I'm not familiar with that one at all, and I apologize. Um, whenever you're dealing with uh, any kind of transaction, any kind of, uh, if you're dealing with just the buyer side, you can create that transaction, that closing, through clicking on the little add button and choose transaction. You want to create a new transaction on on some that's when you have the buyer you're creating a transaction um, if you have the listing already it's your listing you uh, you've got the seller as well we can come over here to the address and change the status from active you know we may know who the seller and stuff is because you know, we've listed it but if you change the status from active to pending then at that point, it's going to pop up and say, do you want to add a new transaction to this property? And I can say yes. And on this one, I didn't put an expiration date. I'm not going to create one right now. But whenever you create that transaction on this property by switching it to pending, it does a couple things. Number one, you'll see that the, the transaction count goes up over here. Um, at the same time, it also links that transaction to the property your listing so that you've got um, access to it there as well. So I can come over here and click on it and it will then open up that transaction that was just created from the listing. From this point, then it's a matter of putting in the additional information for the transaction, any kind of um, earnest deposit money, due diligence stuff, um, all that, um, all the important dates, things that you might know of, uh, the people, who are the people that are involved in the transaction. Now, if, which I didn't have on this particular listing, I didn't have the seller, but if the seller's, uh, the seller's agent information was, was entered on the listing side, it'll come over on the transaction side as well and be filled in. So all you'd have to do is come over here um, and select the buyer and, and buyer two, if there's any of those, put yourself as the buyer's agent if, if you're the buyer's agent. And be able to link the people and then at that point you can come over to the radar and then start your workflows to be able to uh, um, make sure that everything gets done through that closing process whatever closing process that you may have so that's kind of how we handle the escrows uh, the the closing process uh, if you're dealing with you know there there will be escrow companies uh, let's see if I've got any I don't you know if, if you've got an escrow company you can click on add uh, party member and go through here and say you've got an escrow officer as the uh, escrow officer assistant um, so once I select that click on add then I can click and drag my my escrow um, officer into the, the system along with any of the other party members as well. So uh, make sure that you have you get all your people and stuff involved in that. Um, hoping that answered that question. If it didn't, uh, go, go back and re-ask that question. Um, question here, um, the email time feature, will the system automatically tell me the time um, to send, got to be able to see, see the whole message here. Uh, the email time feature, uh, will the system automatically tell me the time to send the client the email or do I have to manually do it? Uh, figure out the time. Okay, right now, as we're looking at it, off of those statuses that we were just talking about, the statuses themselves is just information for you right now. Um, in a in a later phase, uh, within the next 
month. I'm hoping that it all gets uh, completed and in in place. That will actually be an automatic feature for you. So whenever you go to start your workflow and an activity in that workflow would have the option of what time do you want to send this email, you can have it, um, ha there will be an option in there so that you'll be able to say um, client preferred time, I think is what was the, uh, the spec on it. In which case, uh, we are doing the analytics on it to figure out when is the best time that person reads their emails typically. And if it, if there is a preferred time, it will send it at that time. Otherwise it'll, it'll fall back to the normal, like eight o'clock for all your emails time, whatever you have in your settings. So, um, that's, I hope that answers that it's, it's, it'll be an automatic feature right now. It's a matter of, of uh, filling in the gap yourself and sending it if if you want to send it at a certain time. Um, hope that gets that. Okay, Kathy asks, um, how do we get the listing in? Sorry, we just signed up. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so listings. Um, same type of thing. If you're um, doing a listing, you, you want to... Um, uh, add a new listing of, of any type, you would come over here under the add new and whoa, why is that not properties? One second here. Hmm. I'm going to refresh my screen. Something went awry. Might want to go to one of my, other. there we go. Okay. So, um, if you're adding a new listing, it's it's a, a property of yours of some sort. So we're going to click on the little plus and click on property. From the property screen, you'll be able to put in all the pertinent information, the address. If I come in here and say, you know, 111 South Main, um, Bolivar, Missouri, 65613. Um, the listing price, say we're at uh, 230000 the list date, well, I listed it today, so I'll put in today's date. When does it expire? Uh, maybe, you know, three months, four months from now, maybe on the 31st of October, I can put that information in. Um, whenever I tab out of that expiration date, it says, hey, you've got an expiration. You want to make sure that's added to the calendar, and you can say yes if you want that in there. And it'll go ahead and create a, a special um, expiration activity. Technically, you wouldn't have to do that if you create a, uh, a workflow that has that expiration information and notification prior to that, but that just creates an expiration activity so that you know for sure that that's when, when that is, is happening. Um, more of a verification, validation that's going to be done there for you. Um, once you've got the main information up there, you can come to the listing tab. Now, um, I did get a, a question this morning about... Uh, what what is the purpose of having the MLS boards in our system since we don't currently connect to MLSs? And it's it's simply this: each property um, that you put in this, you can assign it an MLS uh, location and its number. So you know whatever MLS number it may have, and whenever you're creating that, if, if this is your primary board, the, the one that you primarily put stuff on, you click on primary. And what it'll do is it'll fill in the MLS number up here at the top. So I'm going to go ahead and click on save. And you'll see that because it is the primary, it went ahead and put the MLS number up here at the top. Now, some agents in uh, that use Rovolv, they are members of multiple boards. So this same property may be put in to multiple MLS systems, in which case you can come over here, click on add new, and you can choose a different uh, MLS and a different number. Um, and then based off of having that information in there, now I've, I've got both numbers. I know which board they're in based off of that number. And the reason why we ask for that information is so that we can label these, these MLS numbers for you so that we know which MLS number goes to which board. That's the primary use of that. A secondary purpose of having those MLS, that MLS information is the fact that we're gathering this for where is are all of our users and what boards are they members of. And down the road, uh, 
we are looking at the, the possibilities of bringing in this information for you guys. Uh, it's just not there yet. If you have IDX Broker as a, as a, um, a service provider for you, idxbroker.com, we do have interfaces with them so that this information, all the detail, the you know basic details of this, the, 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 uh, the photo can all be imported automatically. And in which case it just comes from the features section of the IDX broker. And it's really cool. It's really easy. Um, but uh, not everybody has IDX broker available to them. So you know, adding a, a listing using the plus, adding property, putting in the basic information is, is how you want to go. Once you've got your basic information, you've got your square foot. Maybe we've got uh, you know, 2,400 square feet um, on one acre. Um, I mean, bedrooms, it's a three bedroom, one bath, that would be bad. Uh, two bath, um, one partial bath, garage if there's any, it's a two car garage uh, attached. Um, so you can fill out your information um, however you see fit. So it was built in uh, 2014 in um, you know, whatever subdivision. So filling out all the information that's important to you. Now you can come down here to the commission piece, say, you know, I know we're going to be at uh, 6%, 3%, 3% on each side for the list side and, and buy side. This information then can be used for calculating your potentials off of your dashboard, which is, is important, but also can be um, sent over to the transactional side once that's done. Um, the other things that's really important is the important dates. Whenever you're dealing with with the uh, the two dates at the top, the list date and expiration date, they're gonna we, we go ahead and fill that in down here, and you can change it down here as well as you can at the top. But we wanted to put all the dates together. If there's certain key dates that you want to make sure that you hit, you can put those in here, and then these uh, these dates can be used as milestone dates within your workflow. So if you wanted to say um, you know, uh, five days before target MLS date, uh, I want to do certain things. Well, we have to have what the target MLS date is to be able to calculate five days before it. So any dates that you want to use in this system, you can certainly use and then also use them within the workflow to be able to automate the whole process of listing to contract and then contract to close where you'll deal with it within the transaction side. And there's a whole nother set of dates and, and stuff that go along with that. But lots of information and all of these fields can be used within the templates for uh, emails. So if you're sending out notifications to your seller, hey, just want to let you know that um, on such and such date, maybe the 14th, we put... Uh, your property into the MLS, you know, whatever you you can you can put a lot of that uh, type of state things into a template to let them be notified on a regular basis. And sellers and buyers they like to know what's going on, obviously. So using this information isn't just information for you; it's it's the ability to report it back to your buyers and your sellers. So that's kind of the important part of that. Um, once you've got everything done for your listing, you can come over to the people side. Now, <clears throat> for the people, in this case, you know, we've got a couple key things that we want to make sure that we put in. We want to put in any seller information. Uh, you as the, if you're the, the seller's agent, put in seller agent. Um, so if I wanted to come up here and say, well, <clears throat> I wanted to put myself, um, I'm going to say Mark Step. Um, if I come over here to the people side and I did a search, you'll see that I've got this little um, head and shoulder figurine here. That indicates that this contact record is linked to a user record of Mark Step. <clears throat> Whenever you log into RealVolv, you have a user record. That user record has your login information, your password, that type of stuff. Um, but that information is not a contact record. You can create a contact record and link them under this, the permissions, uh, users and permissions section 
and whenever they're linked, then the record will have this little head mannequin. And what you can do is then just drag that into like the seller agent area. And then that puts me as <clears throat> the seller's agent. Now, I I get it. I, I've been told this multiple times. Why does it say seller agent? Why doesn't it say listing agent? It should. We're, we're in process. We'll be in process of trying to change that whenever before I came on board. Uh, they had it labeled because they wanted to say who's the seller's agent. Um, but a lot of people are getting that confused with selling agent, which would be the person actually selling the property on the transaction side. So uh, that's going to be changed. Just to let you know. But uh, in all key, um, the, the whole key to that is the fact that I've got now a user record, which is tied to my contact. This contact record is in this as the agent. This then allows me to know that this property belongs to me as the user and will be notified on the dashboard. Um, we've got some training on that, and that, that's important to, to know. If I come over here and say, well, you know, Johnny Starr is my seller, um, I can put that in. Now, I don't have to just, I don't have to click and drag if, if I don't want. I can do um, other things as far as, you know, if I've got uh, other names. If I don't know Johnny, maybe Johnny doesn't have a, a spouse or anything, but I now know that spouse, I can you know key that in. If I just want to click in the information, I can certainly do that as well. Um, if there's somebody that got attached and you don't want them attached, it's the wrong person, you can click on, let me go back to that, you can click on the little X. Whenever you move your mouse over it, you can click on your X to remove that contact from the party members in which case it removes it so you can put somebody else in that spot. The whole key to this screen here is to make sure that you're putting in your party members. So again, whenever you're using your workflows and you're sending out templates, if you're sending a template out to the seller or sellers, you might have seller one and seller two in there, um, it knows who to send it to. Now, Johnny, in this particular case, I picked one that doesn't have really any information. Um, if I I can click on Johnny's name and it'll go to his contact record, or I can just click into this field and I can start typing in information as well. So maybe I know what his, uh, his home email address is, you know, um, Johnny at star.com. I have no idea. I hope that's not somebody live. And then I can click on save. Whenever I click on save like that, it goes ahead and updates it here. But if I also go to Johnny's record, it's it's updated it there as well, his, his actual record. So all that's tied together and you don't have to worry about it. But now that I have his email address, if in my template I'm sending a, a template to the seller, I know who I'm sending it to. So that's that's the important part of the people tab, why we have it and what we need it for. Um, any time that you're doing any kind of information about this property that might be going out to the public, any kind of connections, URLs, like, you know, what website it's on, what virtual tour URL, um, if you're, if it's on Zillow, you can put those URLs on there. Um, that those URLs again can be part of merge fields in templates. So you can send information to your seller saying, Hey, uh, just wanted to let you know, we just put the uh, the listing on Zillow, and um, here's the link. Wanted to make sure that you saw it, blah, 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 whatever. So that information can, can be utilized over and over again. Likewise, we've got some narratives. These are basically verbiage, multiple sentence type information that you can put into the, the listing that you might want to use for mail outs or something. Um, one of the uh, things that is important is notification of of this listing to other agents. So you might want to set up an agent marketing narrative where uh, this is information that you'd want to send to all your agents. And then you've got a particular template that then sends out to all your agents uh, that, that has uh, additional information that may not be in the listing or that you want other people to know about. It's just for the agent. Uh, there's internet marketing narratives, things that you might put out on a website and stuff like that, some additional narratives. The, the photo embedded <clears throat> is a place where you can put the HTML, and this gets really kind of out there for some people, but some people utilize this and it's very important to them. 
to be able to put the uh, the actual HTML encoded uh, photo piece in there so that whenever they're sending this, it actually winds up as a photo within their within their system. It's really cool. So um, I don't really use it that much, but uh, some users do. Um, as you whenever you create workflows <clears throat> and as you complete activities, you can have it so that the individual activities on this. Um, on the workflows get added to the seller report. So now I'm just going to click on the add just to add one manually. But if I was to have maybe a, an activity in my workflow that says, uh, put the sign in the yard and lockbox on the door, just, you know, something simple like that. Um, you could have that activity. Once you complete it, you can have that activity automatically add to the seller report area so that um, it would show up as an activity and on what date it was completed and the message then becomes whatever the title is of the the activity which was um, put sign in yard and lockbox on door you know whatever so um, what happens then is every time you complete an activity um, it could automatically add that information then to the seller report, which is what I did just now manually, but you can do it manually, but you can also do it automatically. But maybe also, maybe you've, you know, you want to report on showings or other things that you've done, the agent tour, the open houses that you've done, um, any kind of uh, showings that, that come along. Maybe uh, the contact on this was uh, John, Robert John Doe. Oh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon, I showed the, the property to Lyndon Johnson. Um, Love the bedroom sizes. Now, this is information that you'd want to send to the seller. Uh, you could put any kind of feedback of your own that you wanted to put in there just for your own purposes and also information that's ideally just for you as the, the agent. Um, and they're used for different purposes. But this particular message, the love the bedroom sizes, lack of a better example, um, and also maybe a rating for this person if they rated it or whatever, um, we can save that in there. So now, and, and we've got some workflows to show you how to do this, any of these um, activities that were put into this uh, seller report area can now be sent to the seller, maybe on a weekly basis. You may do something every day or multiple things every day, and, and they're, you're putting them into the seller report area, um, either automatically or manually. And then maybe on Thursday or every other Friday or some, some series that you want, it goes through and it finds anything that you've not previously sent and sends it for you. Um, once something is sent, then a date sent will be applied here. If there's no date sent, we know that it's not been sent, so therefore it's something that should go into the next email that goes out. So a uh, lot of things that can be done there for for the uh, the listing to be able to keep track of what's going on with uh, that listing, make sure that you know what's going on with the, the seller and stuff like that. Uh, the showings tab, and, and I uh, this is one that's a little bit, we really ought to sh change this to showing instructions. This tab here, we don't really, we report all of our showings actually in the seller report area. Uh, the showings tab really is showing instructions. These are the things that, if you were going to show this property, things that you're going to want to have to know. You know, what is the gate code? What is the, the, the alarm code? Uh, what is the lockbox number? That type of things. And these can be used within the merge fields of a template as well. So if you're sending information to a, a uh, another agent, you can certainly get it to them. And that all this tab does is deals with showings, what, what's important for the showings, including the showing instructions, how to get there, that type of stuff, any kind of directions. Maybe, you know, make sure you don't let the dog out type stuff. Um of course, you can put in files and and uh, you know attachments of of any type, PDFs, stuff like that. That's um, pretty self evident. Any type of workflows that you add to this. If I come over here and I want to start it, start a workflow. I can click on start a workflow. Maybe I've got a new listing. Let me see if I've got um, new listing agreement 
on this. I click on next. And these are all the different things that I want to do. Next. It fills in the dates for what I've filled in and does the calculations for everything else. And if there's people that I've already put in, it goes ahead and puts them in. If in this particular case, there's one of my activities deals with a photographer. I may not know who that photographer is yet, so I can leave it blank and I can fill it in later and then it'll, it'll deal with it once I fill it in. Um, but evidently I'm sending an email or making a phone call or something to a photographer and it needs to know who, who I'm going to be calling. Um, at this point, I don't know who that is, so I'm just going to leave it and click on done. So whenever I start a workflow, that adds all those different activities to my calendar. And also, if I come here and look at a month view, I can see now all those different things that, that are going to happen within the calendar. I can see a list view of it just by going under the activities to see what are the things that need to be done. Well, um, put in the listing information in MLS. Yeah, I've done that. Enter the property information into the database. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, schedule the photographer. So now um, you know, I can schedule and, and do the things. Some of these things um, might have to do with checklists and, and phone calls or whatever. And it's, it's important to, to have those types of things put in. Um, these are all just checklists. I've just chosen a different one. But what's important is, is as these get done, let me see if any of these are set up to go. They weren't set up to go to the seller report. Uh, you can have them as they get completed, have it automatically show up in the seller report. This one just didn't have it set up. So that's how you put in a listing. Um, hope that wasn't, I'm sure that was way overkill, but that's really kind of the complete process of putting in a listing. Once once it's in MLS, you can change it from pre-listing. If it's, whenever you add one, it typically adds it as pre-listing. You can add it as um, active once it's in MLS. If you want to do it that way, you can set it to active. Once it's set to active, um, then it will show up. Anytime you want to do any kind of filtering of your contacts, your properties, or your transactions based off of those different statuses, you can do that. Um, if I come under here under properties and say, well, I want to see just my active properties, I can click on active here, and then it brings up everything that's active. Uh, maybe I want to see everything that's active and pending. You know, I can I can certainly do that. So uh, once you set those filters, they stay set until you reset them. So if you come back one day and you say, you know, where's my property at one two three Main Street? I don't see it anymore. Well, it may be that it's filtered out. You may just need to click on your reset filters, and then then it would show up at that point. Um. Okay, let me go to another question here. I spent a lot of time on that one. Uh, can I put all the contact information in the first line example, uh, name, number, address? Um, will the system automatically put all the contact information in the right lines? Uh, no. So like whenever you're doing uh, a contact, let me come over here to Johnny, for instance, the one we just just was working on. Um, whenever you're putting in the information, it's it's definitely important to you know put in the information in the individual fields. Now, if you're entering it from the transaction or the property, there's separate fields that you need to put in as well. But like for the home address, one of the things that we've done is we're showing in this area kind of the full address. But whenever you click into that, it it opens it up and it has you break out those individual fields. So, you know, uh, 111 South Main and come down here to zip code 65613. And then it'll do a lookup for the city, state, county, country information. Um, and then I click on save. It will then show you what the combined address is, but it does not, you, you can't, put the combined address in there anymore. We we used to do that. The problem is, is people were putting it in all kinds of weird and, and whacked out ways. And we weren't able to break it up um, into the individual fields properly. So whenever it got merged out and you wanted to see certain merge fields, like you wanted to show the city field, it wasn't always showing the right information. So um, unfortunately, we, we decided that it was probably best for 
the users to break that information out. So whenever you're keying in information, you do need to break it out into its individual fields. Uh, whenever you're dealing with the properties, it's really the same way for a property. If I go into any property, go into the people tab, and I click into the seller area here, it's going to break it out. So we've got first name, um, um, Joan, and or Joe, you know, whatever. I can you know, key them in individually. Um, Joe Smith. Um, leave whatever blank so individual fields are are there if I click into the um, the home address you'll see that it breaks it up into the individual fields so that we make sure that everything gets uh, put in properly once it's saved then um, it shows the entire contents uh, question from Kathy will this be on YouTube yes I am recording it so we'll put this back on YouTube once I get it downloaded and, and uploaded back up to YouTube, hope that will be useful to you. Um, okay, anybody else have any other questions? We've got uh, about nine more minutes for this session. If you've got any questions, we can certainly go over that. You know, I spent a lot of time on that new listing, which um, hope that was helpful. But I want to make sure that that one was covered. Anybody have anything else? Got to go, got to go. Um, how do you manage multiple offers on a property? Okay, um, this question has come up quite a bit. We've been talking about it on YouTube, or not on YouTube, on uh, Facebook. Um, right now, the uh, we don't have the offer section ready. It's not done yet. Um, what some people are doing is whenever they they have an offer, um, you can come over here and, of course, you can tag it saying um, uh, backup offer, like backup offer one, backup offer two, or whatever, as a tag to let you know that it does have a backup offer. Um, what, and, and we don't have all the fields, and that's kind of where we're working at right now is to figure out what all fields are people really interested in knowing about that backup. Um, what a lot of people are doing for right now is coming into the notes field and putting in the details of that backup offer in the notes area. Say, you know, backup offer one, um, and it's at, uh, you know, 300,000 or whatever. Um, no conditions, no contingencies, you know, whatever you want to put in there. Um, and in addition to that, what you can do is if you've got individuals where you've got maybe a name or something like Sally Scott here, I can right click on that and say um, uh, copy link address. So if I come back over here and um, put <clears throat> click in here, hit shift enter to take it to the next line, I can do a control V and paste that in. And what that does then is that copies that URL for that particular property into um, that um, radar. And now it's a link. So now not only do I have the information about the property, but I also have the information on the contact for that. Um, so that if I wanted to go to it, I can click on it and it'll bring up that pertinent information about that, that person. And I can put other details and stuff on there. That's not ideal. I get it. I understand that. Um, but until we get the uh, the offer section done, it's kind of the the way that everybody's doing it. Hope that makes sense. Thank you for that question, Michael. Um, but you know, you can put whatever you want to in the notes and be able to see that. Any other questions? Did that answer that? First off, Michael, I hope it did. If not, you might want to uh, contact me and we can go through it in more in depth any other questions okay I'm gonna go ahead and great that does it for now okay guys thank you so much um, I hope this let me know if these sessions help uh, I know that I talk fast a lot 
and it's trying to get as much into as little time as we've got, and, and I want to make sure that I cover as much as possible. Uh, so if, if there's anything that uh, you guys need or want after this, certainly send me an email or uh, post it in the Facebook group. Make sure you visit our Facebook group. We've got a great user group there and uh, a lot of great users that give a lot of really good input on questions that come up from people. So um, hope you guys enjoyed that. If there's anything else, let us know. You guys have a great day.